You're about to listen to a new episode of the Redefining Cybersecurity podcast with Sean Martin. Have you ever thought we're selling cybersecurity insincerely, buying it indiscriminately, and deploying it ineffectively? Well, perhaps we are. Let's look at how we can organize a successful information security program that integrates business culture with people, process, and technology to drive growth and protect business value. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. Pentera, the leader in automation security validation, allows organizations to continuously test the integrity of all cybersecurity layers by emulating real-world attacks at scale to pinpoint the exploitable vulnerabilities and prioritize remediation towards business impact. Learn more at pentera.io. Hello, everybody. You're very welcome to a new episode of Redefining Cybersecurity here on ITSP Magazine. This is Sean Martin, your host, of course. And I get to talk to all kinds of cool people about cool things that uh, we we try to uh, deal with and handle from a cybersecurity perspective. So practitioners and leaders in all sizes of organizations uh, trying to build security programs that hopefully enable the business to uh, achieve its objectives in a secure way. Uh, not always a fun task, and uh, we get to unpack some of the challenges that's, that folks uh, folks encounter and hopefully get some insights from, from people who've experienced some things that, uh, that might apply to your organization. So we're gonna, we're gonna spend some time today talking about passwords and passwords manager, password managers and MFA and who knows what else. Uh, I don't know if we'll get into PKI or not, but. Uh, Anyway, we'll, we'll talk about some fun things, and I'm thrilled to have Ted Hyman on. How are you, Ted? I'm doing excellent, Sean. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on, and uh, yeah, I'm excited for this. We've been we've been uh, chasing each other on uh, on calendars for a while, and we finally pulled this together. So I I appreciate your uh, flexibility, and uh, hopefully everybody gets to uh, gets to enjoy this conversation. I know I am. So let's um let's start with maybe few words from you about what you're up to, maybe some of the experiences you've had, roles you've had, and uh, why this topic of passwords? I, I think I think may I may have prompted some of that, but uh, your your thoughts on that topic in general? Yeah, so um, I am the CEO of a cybersecurity practice called CISO Guru. And I have been in the security industry for over 25 years. I actually started when people wanted to start connecting their networks to the internet and I was selling firewalls. And I've been in the industry and seen, uh, you know, quite a bit of technology that's been uh, developed to, to try and stop breaches and uh, prevent the attacks that organizations are seeing. And, um, it's been a real challenge. I've worked with some of the largest organizations in the world, as well as the DOD, helping them try and solve this problem. And so I think that, you know, passwords, I think most people would agree are something that they have a real challenge with and aren't really always sure what they should do or, or how the password should be used. And so I think it's an, an awesome time for us to talk about that and talk about why 75 to 80 percent of breaches that happen today are uh, are conducted using a valid credential and in most cases it's a static password that they've been able to get access to and so um it's become a real challenge for the enterprise yeah and it, 
it's, I don't know if it's funny, it's not the right word, but maybe ironic, <laughs> and something that presumably started so simply in the beginning. Um, a few machines, you had a password, you probably wrote them down on a, on a notepad, um, has become complex, yet still a core part of how we operate our, our IT infrastructure and, and connect to systems and data and applications and whatnot. Um, but it's not sexy, right? <laughs> it's, it's not the cool new SIM, uh, SIM rack system or the, or the new AI enabled uh, EDR or whatever it is that, that everybody's chasing right now. Um, so I think it, it kind of gets left to the side in terms of, of where huge investments are made, if you ever get a huge investment in, in a security program. Um, but that doesn't mean to your point that it isn't critical as a, as a key component. So maybe, can you start for us, maybe kind of a history of the password, how it started, and maybe how we ended up to where we are today. And I'll, I'll jump in as you say stuff, because I'm sure you're going to trigger some some flashbacks for me. <laughs> you're talking about connecting networks, networks to the internet. I did a lot of that uh, for a construction company, which was a lot of fun. Absolutely. So, yeah, feel free Hopefully. to jump in anytime. I so. certainly will. I certainly will. Uh, so the first thing I want to say is that passwords are a remnant of a time gone by when companies had local area networks that were pretty much confined to that organization. And it was merely a simple way to keep track of who was gaining access to what systems. And, and for that purpose, it was fairly fairly successful. Um, you know, it, it wasn't a scenario like we have today where everybody's connected to the internet. And so passwords worked just fine back then. Um, but even, even 25 years ago, we already realized that we needed a better way to authenticate. And, and people may have had, um, you know, familiarity with like RSA tokens or Yubico keys or other types of USB fobs that are used as a, a way to, uh, to do multi-factor authentication. But, and it's been around forever, but it, it, it's hard to believe that almost 60% of the organizations out there, large enterprises are still leveraging static passwords. And I think that, I think that that's, that's part of the challenge. And so if we start, you know, so, okay, you had a password, you're on a local area network, you could gain access to the systems that you needed to. Then comes the internet. And so everybody had to install a firewall. And so basically you had, you know, a big moat around your network and, and your firewall was the one gate that you had to get through to get to your network. And, um, and then, and so at that point, then passwords started to become uh, more challenging because as, as things evolved, we started connecting not only to the internet, but we started connecting to other divisions, business partners, suppliers, vendors. And now you've got so many ingress and egress points on your network that it, that making sure somebody is who they say they are is really critical. And so for 25 years, we've really been working on trying to solve this problem. And the fact that we're still using static passwords today is a, is a real, real challenge. So let's talk about some of the some of the uh, the, the current challenges because well let me see here so you, you gave the stat to the, the number of of uh, breaches rooted in in uh, valid credentials so and you've said static a few times so my my sense is that. I don't know. There, I know there's some best practices: thirty days, ninety days, whatever, to recycle the passwords and reset them. Do we? Are we just not doing something correctly, or, or I mean, is it is it a policy issue? Is it a control issue? Is it a scale issue? Is it? I don't know. What what are companies challenged with with respect to passwords? That's leaving us vulnerable to seventy five percent of the breaches, whatever it was. <laughs> driven by a password that's that's stolen so yeah so it's a technology issue and and it's a a human being issue okay so from a technology perspective 
it's an issue because if you're using a password that doesn't change, there are many ways for people to gain access to that password and use it to, to uh, impersonate you. So, you know, it's, so the static password, that, that's really the challenge. And, and, and the, what, what happens is this. So, I mean, you know, you could talk about the history of the password, right? We started with, you know, our dog's name or our kid's name or our favorite sports team's name or, you know, something that we were really familiar with and that we could remember easily. Because as human beings, that's how we relate to things, by stories, by pictures, by activities. And so that was real easy. And then they told us, well, that's not complicated enough. You need to use uppercase and lowercase uh, letters to make your comp your uh, password more complex uh, to defend from brute force attacks. And so then everybody uh, changed and added a capital N at the beginning of their password and and uh, some uppercase and lowercase there. And th then they told us we had to add a number and then it was a special character. And so, you know, now our password is one Oakland A's uh, uh, exclamation point with the A being an ampersand instead of a, a, an A or whatever. And so we've made these complex passwords that are very, very difficult to memorize. Human beings' brains just weren't de designed to memorize these passwords. And so we do the one thing or two things that you're never supposed to do. One, we write them down. And that defeats every, every purpose of a password. As soon as you've written it down on a piece of paper and it's tucked, up, tucked under your mouse pad or stuck to your monitor with a sticky note or in a little pad or file that you keep, um, you've got now a bigger problem. And the, the other challenge is that at, at, as from a technology and a security perspective, the weakest link sits between the keyboard and the chair. So that's us, that human beings. And so when I say it's a technology challenge and a human being challenge, it's both because one, we're still using a technology that's outdated and that's easily compromised. And, and, and so it's, you know, we've, we, we've made it easy for them, but two, you know, we tend to reuse our passwords across multiple different sites because if you had to remember a different password for every site and application that you had to access, you, you could never do it. So then what do we do? Okay. I can't remember all these passwords. So then we introduced something called password managers and uh, that was a whole new, uh, you know, a whole new concept. Look, you don't have to remember your passwords anymore. We can just stick them up in this application. It'll automatically remember them for you and all the problems are solved. Uh, the challenge there is that now we've put all our eggs in one basket. And so every, every key, every password, every access token that we have is now stored with that application. And That's unfortunately, one some of those password, password managers have been hacked. <laughs> one password manager, and no, no second factor usually on those as we as well. So, the, as you're describing this, and um, I don't know, you you and I have had the the, the luxury, you'll say, of uh, looking at this for a while. <laughs> you 25, me me around 30. Um, there are probably a lot of people listening to this show that uh, that say passwords we have that kind of under control it kind of kind of sucks but at least we have some control over it what um the, the the stat you mentioned though suggests otherwise so i can i can see kind of a a level of maturity where regulated industries large organizations that that uh, really value security might have um, a high bar for for yeah, policies and controls, and their and their password stuff is is well suited to to meet the risk appetite. And then there are others that that probably don't. Right, and I'm thinking smaller smaller organizations, mom and pop shops. Uh, yeah, some some of the folks in the middle of the supply chain, if you will. Um, wh where do you see? I guess my question is: Do we think we have it under control, and we really don't, or? Um, What's kind of the status of, of password management at the moment? 
I think most security experts would agree that static passwords are no longer an effective way to secure our networks and our data. So the real challenge is then, okay, what do we do about it? How, 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 do, we, how do we fix this problem that's been created um, over the years? And that comes down to looking at some alternative technologies that are very effective at uh, pr protecting access to systems and networks. And this is where we introduce something called multi-factor authentication or MFA. And this is an idea that's been around for a very long time and we're all very, very familiar with it. And this is the concept of an ATM. We all use ATMs on a regular basis. We walk up to our ATMs, we insert something we have, which is our, our credit card, we, we enter something that we know, which is a pin, and we're able to get money out, out of our account through that mechanism. And even to, through today, and this technology has been in, in place a long time because I implemented the very first online banking system in, in the United States. So this has been going on for a very long time. And you can see that banks have been very successful and very, very uh, few ATMs are ever compromised Otherwise, the banks would be looking for a better way to secure them. And so this concept of now going to MFA, multi-factor authentication, where instead of just a static password, we're leveraging something you have and something you know. And so today, I think really the most familiar one that people are, you know, ha have, have run into is the idea that you log on to the system and it wants to send you an SMS message to your phone with some kind of code that you then enter into uh, the application to gain access. And this takes security. I mean, it takes fr from passwords to multi-factor authentication. They're a universe apart. And there are ways to get around multi-factor authentication, but they're really hard. You have to be really smart. And multi-factor authentication really eliminates probably 99% of the challenges that you have around um, access control and people getting access to systems that they shouldn't. So one, so one might even suggest that the static password is okay if you have MFA. <laughs> I'm well, yeah, yeah. if you have MFA, your static password is your pin, you reused it over Perfect. and over again. But the it's reality like is- the model of the bank. Of the yeah, ACM. without your phone though, and, and your phone number, you're not going to get that code. So the code is that, that, you know, not only is something that you know, but your phone is something that you have. And then the code is, is another level of security where you're actually entering that code. So is it an issue that, that uh, organizations aren't leveraging MFA? And is that, is that a cultural, if so, is that a cultural thing? Is it a technology or maybe it's, or a program thing where they just haven't figured out how to get it all over the place? Or is it an issue with the technologies they've selected? So some might allow or might have MFA enabled, others might still only rely on passwords, or is it a end user behavioral thing? We're all the above. I don't know. What are you seeing? <laughs> it's all of the above without question. It's all of the above. So I think we've, you know, once again, we've all come to the understanding that static passwords are a challenge and, and we're, you know, the fact that we still use them is a challenge. And what the, uh, what the bad guys have figured out is that it's easier to hack a human being than it is to hack a firewall or a NAC system or a configuration management system or some other way to try and get into your network. They don't do that. It, it's too hard. It's very difficult. It's much easier to, to, to trick a human being into doing something that um, that they shouldn't do, which then impacts the organization as a whole. And so, you know, I, without you know getting too deep into the concept, but if you think about ransomware and malware, the way that that usually gets injected into the the network and your systems is because somebody sends you an email and it's about something important like um, your iCloud is full and if you don't sign up for more space, you're gonna lose all your pictures. 
And then we as human beings emotionally react to those emails. And so instead of taking the time to look at who did this email come from? Does this email look right? Is everything spelled correctly? You know, okay, this is a valid email. Unfortunately, as human beings, our emotions get to us first and we click and then go, oh, shoot. And at that point, it's too late. The malware is already being loaded. The ransomware has already been injected. And you've now created a huge multi-million dollar problem for the enterprise. And, um, and, and it, it's as simple as just thinking before, you know, thinking before you act or acting before you think, however you want to look at it. But, but we as human beings are, are fairly easy to, to fool. And one of the things that's happening now with AI is that they're being able to create even more compelling, more emotionally, uh, you know, uh, compelling uh, content to make us click and to make us look, think and look like it's coming from a valid source. And that that's pretty scary. So what, what are your thoughts on passwordless systems where you get, it's effectively, well, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but effectively you get in, but it's, I guess it's two, two second factors, right? If I'm not mistaken, you, you get an email and then you also get a text or something. Um, and, and the email includes the link that allows you to log in. So I guess by virtue, you're, you're accessing the system and logging in with the, probably some kind of key or code through the email. Um, and then perhaps a second, uh, second, second factor, uh, SMS on your phone or something or, or, uh, yeah, an authenticator app like uh, Google or Authy or something. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the that's the definition of a password or the model of a password passwordless system. But what are your thoughts on that? Do you think because then at that point you're not managing any passwords for anybody, right? Yeah, and and that's the goal. I think that's where we really need to go. And I think that companies are understanding this, and and enterprises are starting to implement this. So if imagine a concept where you walk into your office and your computer automatically initiated a Bluetooth session with your phone, an encrypted Bluetooth session with your phone, so that it recognizes who you are. And then all you have to do is hold your phone up and use facial recognition, which is part of our phones today, biometrics, which is part of our phones today, or merely enter a pin which is something that's very simple to do. And so what we have to do is we have to make the first authentication really strong. So we wanna make sure you are who you say you are. So we're gonna use multi-factor authentication to prove that you are who you say you are with a fairly high level of confidence. But then from that point on, there's, there's a technology called single sign-on where every time you need to access an application behind that initial authentication, it happens automatically, transparently for you, and you're able to access that other system uh, through that through that transparent mechanism. And then now we've developed something that's called constant authentication that we leverage with single uh, you know single source. So constant authentication now is this cool new technology that actually authenticates you based on behavioral analysis. So we can, over time, learn how Sean Martin types or how Sean Martin uses a mouse and these types of things, what applications you go to on a regular basis. All this background information that we're able to gather about a user, we can now leverage that to do constant authentication. And then the, the user never has to enter another password unless at some point we feel like the session may have been compromised or something doesn't look right. And at that point, the system might come back to you and say, hey, we just want to make sure you are who you say you are, you know, and, and, and you might have to authenticate again. But the goal is to pretty much eliminate the requirement to authenticate to every application with a different mechanism and every tool with a different mechanism. And so 
Um, I think that that's where we want to go. And I think that most large enterprises are moving very quickly in this direction because getting rid of static passwords is the first step in zero trust. If you're implementing a zero trust you know, type of architecture, the first thing you do is eliminate static passwords. So, um, you know, so I think that that's something that, that, you know, we, we really need to think about as well. And are, are the, are the systems and for those listening, who know this answer, um, forgive me, but I don't implement, uh, authentication systems. So that's why I'm asking, are, are the systems in place to support endless variety of applications and systems and things like that because let's face it there's a lot of old legacy stuff out there i'm sure there's still windows 95 floating around somewhere and team right so uh, those aren't being updated anymore so i don't even know if they support uh second factor login unless you've added added something i don't know so i guess my point is we have a lot of legacy stuff you can't you can't just flip a switch to passwordless i don't think so how do we how do we arrive to a point where we have a password list, no static passwords needed, no M, no um, password managers needed, uh, some way to manage a second factor, multi factor uh, system as part of this um, where necessary, but that, ultimately that continuous authentication model. How how do we get there from where we are today? So. I, that's absolutely correct. And there are legacy systems out there and, and there are proprietary systems out there that companies have built. Um, there are certain systems and applications that you're not going to be able to authenticate the way you might to the majority of your application. So what I would say is that those are the outliers. And, and when I've helped companies deploy two-factor authentication across their entire organization, I've run into those in every every time. There are those outliers. And what we do is we do what every CISO does, which is manage the risk and understand that we have that risk and then make sure that it's an acceptable risk to the enterprise. And, you, and that possibly you've taken other steps to make it difficult for, for, for instance, somebody on the internet to gain access to one of those legacy systems by micro segmenting your network to make it very difficult for anybody to get to it. But, but with security, there's no such thing as 100% security. With security, you know, we're, we're just constantly trying to improve and get better and better and closer to 100%, but we never are gonna get to 100%. It, there's always gonna be these outliers. And so, um, but let's not let, you know, uh, the perfect be the enemy of good, right? I mean, we can lock down 90 plus percentage of our applications and systems with two-factor authentication. And, and most of these systems are, are designed to work with two-factor. So, so just because a, a few of your systems might not be able to be incorporated into the overall th authentication, screen, uh, authentic authentication scheme, um, it doesn't mean that you should say, oh, because of that, I'm not going to implement two-factor authentication. What it means is two-factor authentication is still very important. You should have implemented across your organization as best you can to the systems that you can, and then manage the risk around the other systems that you have, that, that you, that you know, are legacy because you have other issues with those systems, right? You can't update the software on them. There's no patches available. There's all kinds of issues with those legacy systems. And so, you know, enterprises should be working to eliminate those legacy systems as they go, but, it, but they shouldn't wait to do that before they implement, you know, a, a, a two-factor authentication scheme. And are there, are there challenges in implementing 2FA, MFA, passwordless, continuous auth solutions? I'm just thinking, at least we have the oil, a well oil machine. And, and when it comes to, I forgot my password, right? A lot of that's automated. There might be some help desk involved to uh, kind of close the gap there. If somebody loses their phone. Somebody loses their uh, YubiKey. key. Um, 
a little more challenging, right? There's a cost with the YubiKey. <laughs> the phone, that's a whole other story, but if that's the only way, if the authenticator app is on the phone and, and that's the only way to get that that uh, code, um, that's a whole other thing. So how, how do organizations kind of, or are there others like that and how do organizations overcome some of those challenges? So uh, I, there's, there's kind of two things that happen. So I, I did an extensive amount of work with the Department of Defense to roll out the new military ID badge, which is the common access card. And it's basically your key to everything in the military. It's your key to the base. It's your key to the facility. It's your key to get on any of the military networks, ZipperNet, NipperNet, et cetera. And so if you show up to the gate and you don't have your CAC card, you're going home to get it. And if you've lost your CAC card, they're going to escort you directly to a place where you can go and have your CAC card replaced. So with the military, it's you don't have it, you don't get in. With the enterprise, it's a little bit hard to do that. And, and, and you know, people forget things. I, I've forgotten my phone. I've forgotten other things that I needed when I left the house. And, and, and that happens. It's, it, it's happened. So we have to set up a, a system to uh, when that happens to allow those people to gain access to systems um, temporarily until they're uh, till they've got their phone or their token or whatever they need back. And so that's just part of rolling out two-factor authentication to the organization. And, and you know, one of the challenges with two-factor is it touches everybody in the company. From the janitor to the CEO, it touches everybody. Because you're not going to have exceptions for those people. Oh, I'm a CEO. I don't have to use two-factor. No, it touches everybody. So Rolling it out is, is complex and it needs to be done in a way that you're doing it in stages and understanding the repercussions and expanding uh, the deployment as you go and not try and do one giant installation. That rarely works. And do you see, I know you talked about kind of the legacy system and, and don't not do two-factor because you have legacy systems, so get started on something else. But do you see the, the zero trust password list and continuous off? Is it, is it right there to touch where we can, I don't know if we have, to, we still need two or multi-factor, right? In those schemes as well, I would imagine, especially for high, high highly critical transactions, perhaps. Because um, I guess we didn't even talk about that, right? The idea that you you log in and you might have stepped authentication <laughs> for for certain things. If, you're, if you move fifty bucks between accounts, yeah, your current authentication is good. If you lose fifty thousand, you might have to re-enter your password. If you move fifty million, you're going to get two keys and and your your uh, counterpart to sign in as well. Um, but anyway, I guess my my question is, do are we at a point where we can kind of skip some of the old, like why bother with password manager, just jump straight to uh, to two factor, multi-factor, right? Yeah. I, mean, I, th I think the password manager was an intermediary step. It was, it was, it was a terrible idea to begin with because all you did was take a problem and exacerbate that problem by adding password managers. Because as you know, as soon as a company implements a password manager, then every 30 or 60 or 90 days, now they want you to change your password. And so, you know, it's just now there's just a ton of passwords. And, and the, what the password managers do is kind of act as a database, a place for us to store this information that we can't remember and can access easily. And so password managers, you know, it was it was a way to try and improve on 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 the issues with static passwords, but it also created other issues, as I mentioned, where if all your passwords are in one place, all eggs in one basket, and that basket gets hacked, because the reality of the situation is most of those uh, password managers, you authenticate to them with a static password, a hopefully a very strong static password, but a static password. So it didn't really solve the problem. It made um, complexity for the users actually go up. And I know for me, 
you know, one of the biggest frustrations I have is you can actually have a password manager create a password for you, a really strong password. And then you're out and you're trying to use your phone and it wants you to log in and you don't remember what that password was. So now you got to go find your password manager system, look up the password and, and put it in, which, which is frustrating. So I think that password managers were an attempt to improve on what we had, but inevitably they actually made the, the, the problem worse because, because it gave people um, a sense of security that wasn't real. Yeah, yeah. Ma master weakness. <laughs> ah. uh, centralized weakness, anyway, I don't really use that word. But anyway, the um, yeah, it's an interesting time. We didn't even get into the username, user ID, kind of the idea, the identity part of the access. We only talked about the the access part, but um, uh, there's a lot there too. I'd say in terms of, I mean, there's what's the idea? Is it your email? Is it a log uh, username you create? Is is that shared? Is it <laughs> or is it unique for all? There's a hide my email for at least for a lot of the consumer based stuff. You can you can use hide my email. Um, so you're obfuscating the the ID uh, in addition to the password. I don't know. We uh, don't necessarily need to go down that path. I think. Oh, no, we, we can do a whole nother, a whole nother uh, discussion <laughs> about identity and access management and why yeah. identity is so critical for organizations today. Because identity is the new perimeter. Because we have so many ingress mm -hmm. and egress points on the network, we need another way to know who's doing what. And, and what identity systems do, identity access management systems do is give us that visibility. And so they're very critical to the enterprise and they are a critical step in improving your security overall. So we definitely, identity access management is kind of the, taking all of this to the next level. Yep. And, um, and we should definitely take some time to talk about that. Yeah. And the other thing we touched on before we started recording was the, I mean, this is all user-based human human based uh, authentication we didn't even get to machine to machine and app to app and service to service and api to api <laughs> and and that all the combinations that those those hold with by the way a user sitting in front of it kind of orchestrating all those things um so maybe another conversation there too because uh, those use static things that do rotate but those have to be managed as well as we we talked about well ted um Super interesting. Uh, I think the, the history to the present uh, is, is really cool. Any, any final thoughts on where things are heading? I, I think the, the continuous auth is a pretty exciting future. I don't know what the status of that is, but uh, anything else you want to touch on before we wrap up here? No, I think right now that's really the state of the art. If you can get to constant authentication for 95% of your users, you've done an incredible service to your organization and you've reduced the risk of a breach by huge percentages. I mean, like I said in the beginning, 75 to 80% of, of breaches happen because of a, a valid static credential. So if we can get rid of those static passwords, it's a huge step in the right direction from a security perspective. And um, you know, I, I've done this for, for the biggest corporations in the world and the Department of Defense. I appreciate the, uh, the conversation here, Ted, and uh, a lot of good insights. And hopefully we got people to think. That's my main objective, right? If they can take something and take action, that's even better. But at least start thinking about things. And hopefully uh, hopefully we give some nuggets here today. So thanks, Ted. Oh, it's my pleasure, Sean. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And as my coffee machine uh, grinds away in the background, I want to thank everybody for listening to uh, – listening and watching uh, this episode of Redefining Cybersecurity here on ITSP Magazine. We'll put some links in the show notes to connect with Ted, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all again soon, and Ted, hopefully another chat. I think we uncovered a couple more things to dig into, so at some point we'll have, a, have you back on the show. I look forward to it, Sean. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, everybody. See you on the next one. Pentera, the leader in automation security validation. 
allows organizations to continuously test the integrity of all cybersecurity layers by emulating real-world attacks at scale to pinpoint the exploitable vulnerabilities and prioritize remediation towards business impact. Learn more at pentera.io.